Um, welcome everyone. Today we are talking about assessment for learning again, but with a specific and key focus on low tech solutions. Um, unfortunately, we know that not all our schools are equipped with a great with 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 um, comprehensive technology, learner devices, the one to one devices, etc. Those things, these are wonderful dreams that we have, but we have to be realistic about what our context is. So for me, it was important to go and explore a couple of low tech solutions you could also find ways that you can still use digital assessment, um, but if you might not be geared with everything. Some of the things we're going to look, look at today, you don't even need ESCOM to be up and running for us, um, for you to use some of these assessment techniques. But before we get to that, I think it's critical. Um, some of you might have not been in that session last week or might not, we, or, or might just want to refresh on this thing again. And that is, for me, this is one of the most important things for us to understand. What is the feedback loop? The in totality we have, and it's something that I talk about often, um, in order to understand what this whole process is. So the feedback loop starts over here, and this is what we call, in other words, teaching. This is when we build content knowledge. First and foremost, we talk to our learners, we discuss certain things with them, and we try to construct new knowledge. Then. In order for us to be able to know whether or not they've actually learned it, we assess the content knowledge. Now, this is done in many different ways. Um, we all know formal assessments when learners have to write tests and we know um, about projects and all sorts of things to assess the knowledge that they have. We do this in smaller ways as well. We ask kids questions in class. Raise your hand. Do you have, um, does anyone know the answer? We ask them to do homework. There's lots of ways that we assess, but effectively what assessment really means is we check whether or not the content knowledge was built successfully. Then a critical step is once we've assessed that, we need to give them feedback. Do they know or what, what did they get wrong? What don't they understand? This can be done, in, this can be done either as a teacher giving feedback or a learner find getting feedback on his own. But here's the crux for me. Um, and then obviously the idea is this feedback we should be using to identify missing knowledge. What is missing? What part of the knowledge have we not covered yet? And then lastly, once we know what we have not covered yet, we go and build that knowledge again. And in this way, you'll see what we're effectively trying to do is we're trying to create a cycle of learning. So we build knowledge. We test whether the, or not the knowledge has been achieved. We give feedback on that, <coughs> either to the learner, <coughs> either from a teacher's perspective or from a, um, a kind of doing your self-feedback. And then we identify missing knowledge. Now, the problem is what's happening very often is we actually have a feedback loop that is broken. And it's missing this top part. So there's nothing happening here. We build content knowledge. Then we assess whether or not the content knowledge has been learned. And then we give them feedback. But there's a big problem with the feedback we give them. And that it simply comes down to time. When do we give them feedback? How long does it take for them to get feedback? How long does it take us to be able to give them feedback? Because I remember very well, that's one of the biggest things. I was an English home language teacher um, for grade 10 to 12 learners, feedback is a nightmare because it takes forever to mark those essays, to mark those tests. All of it takes so, so very long. And the problem is because we're not using our assessment for learning, the kind of feedback we're trying to give learners is often only based on summative assessment. And the nature of how things are structured in terms of of, of our curriculum is by the time we do summative assessment, there's already some element of pressure on us to go on to the next thing. We need to move on and we need to get to the next part of the work that needs to be taught. But the problem is because we haven't actually gone and identified the missing knowledge, we are what we're doing is we're building new knowledge on a faulty um on 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 faulty foundations. 
if we spend a bit more time trying to re-establish this feedback loop, if we spend a bit more time trying to make sure that we can get this part of the feedback loop happening more effectively, the feedback and the identifying missing knowledge, then surely we're going to have greater success in our summative assessment. Um, but the problem is doing this takes time. So the critical thing is what we want to do is assessment for learning. As you can see, it closes the feedback loop. Critical thing, it actually closes it. And how does this assessment for learning idea try to close? It tries to give us instant feedback. Because we cannot build the feedback loop on summative assessment, the nature of summative assessment or formal assessment, depending on what you want to call it, the nature of that is so that it takes longer to mark. We're not necessarily at the point where we will be doing formal assessment with digital tools, even though to a certain extent it can be done, but the system is not is, is not quite used to that yet. So we need to try and really leverage this idea of instant feedback. And it would be great if we all had tablets in our classrooms or if all our learners had mobile devices and they were all connected to the internet and the internet was always stable, then we could do a lot of these things in, in, in different ways than what I'm going to show you today. Um, and ways that are arguably even more effective, even quicker. Um, but we have to be realistic. That's not the scenario that we are in. We are in a scenario where we do not always have that kind of technology. We want to do this kind of thing, but how and where do we go from now? So we want to look at how can we make this feedback instant? What do we do to do this? What are the processes that we can put into place to try and make this feedback as instant as possible, both for your sake and for the learner's sake? Because remember, from a teacher's perspective, Instant feedback helps you to understand whether or not the learning outcomes have actually been met. So you can quickly determine, I, I've just taught these kids, um, to take an example of, from my own, um, I've just taught these kids this poem. Let me test whether or not they know it, and then we will go on or not go on, depending on what my test reveals to me. So one way to do that is lots of little class tests, but then marks all those class tests you can get the kids to mark it themselves that's an option of course um but then i mean there, there are always kind of little things involved with that <clears throat> and then the setting of the tests itself who sets those tests where do you get all this anyway there's a lot of there's a lot of elements to that so we want to make in we want to make feedback instant we want to do more formal assessment or informative assessment but at the same time we have to be mindful of a pressurized curriculum. We have to be mindful of the fact that there's always the next thing that needs to happen. This is the context with, within which teachers operate. And we know this and, and we understand this. So for me, I wanted to find a quick and easy way for us to be able to achieve this. And very importantly, how do we do it without learner devices? Because if we're going to be realistic, the majority of our schools are in that position. Now, I know the, the, the session that um, Craig will have with you on um, Quizlet, for example, he will tell you, and he's 100% correct, you don't need a fancy tablet. You can do all of these things on a smartphone if learners have those. And there's lots of different ways that try and, and and maybe run a project where you get all the smartphones in you clear them and you use them as devices in the classroom but what do we do if we have no learner devices or the internet is out for example um how do we get around these things or in in the case of the one tool i'm going to show you escom um unfortunately as as shut down the power how do we deal with these things so there are the, the we are talking about digital assessment so there has to be some element of device involved. We can't do it with no devices. So what are the devices that we're going to need? Right, so what you will need, there are two different tools that we will be looking at. The first tool you will have to have, for both tools, you'll need to have a smartphone and you'll need to have a, um, a teacher a laptop or desktop, one of the two. Um, you'll need to have those things. You could theoretically, 
get away with a one tool by only having a smartphone? I would not recommend it though. So you need to have a smartphone and a desktop for the first one we will be looking at. And then the first tool, but only the first tool, it is better if you are connected to a data projector or a TV or however you are projecting in your classroom. It works better if you have that. If you don't have that, you can still do it by reading out the questions to the learners. But it's one of those cases where the questions will appear on the on the projector. I'll show you how that works now. So it is better if you can do it that way around. Again, if you if there is no if if there um is no projector or there's no TV or there's nothing to project to, you could still do this by reading it out. The other one we are going to use, you only need your device to set it up. You do not need it in the classroom environment. And you also don't need it with you while you are using it. It's only for the setup and for the marking process where you actually need it. That's the part that I said it's exciting because theoretically, if you're in a classroom environment, once you've set these things up, you don't need a single digital device with a second one. So what are these things that we want to show you? The first one I want to show you is a thing called quizzes, right? Um, so quizzes, the one we're going to look at for quizzes is very similar to a thing called clickers, right? So thanks, Melissa. Melissa's put up a poll there regarding clickers. Please answer that. Yes, I've used it. Yes, but I have not used it. No, what is clickers, right? So. It seems that we've got one person who's used it. We've got three. Uh, we've got a mixed bag. The majority of you have not heard of it. Some of you have heard of it. Some of you have used it. Right, great. So we've got lots of varied responses here. It does look like the vast majority of you have not used it. So I can also say that there is an alternative to what we're going to be using today called clickers. That's very similar to this. The only thing is I kind of like quizzes for a couple of other reasons. I've always liked quizzes. It's a great quizzing tool, but it's got a couple of extra cool features added to it that you don't get on Plickers. So, and then the second one we'll look at, and we'll get to that one later, is a thing called SwiftGrade. Right, so are we ready? Let's dive into the first one called quizzes. And this is specifically the printed version of it. So I want to show you before we get started with anything else. Um, I'm going to just turn on my camera quickly and I'm going to stop my sharing because I want to show you what's going on here. Right. So you'll see on your screen, Melissa, I just want to double check. Is it showing yep. on your end? Awesome. Yep. Right. So. And just tell me if my voice goes away a little bit because I'm just moving to where my things are. On the screen, you will see there are two cue cards. Now, technically, what happens is every learner receives one of these things. And this is how they will answer your questions. So how it works, you'll see that every learner, it says here P1 over there. So P1, meaning that this is the first participant. And then all of them get a unique block that looks like this. And what's going to happen is I'm actually going to put up a question. And then learners need to decide whether or not it is either going to be A or it's going to be B or it's C or it's D. So it's a multiple choice thing that they answer, but without needing a device. So you'll see if I put the two next to each other, What's actually going to happen is as a teacher, what I will do is I will scan these two blocks. And the system on the other end will go, will recognize that this block belongs to P1, whoever person one is, and it will recognize that I am showing whatever's shown at the top. The A is what I've selected. So in other words, now I say that the answer to this question is A. This one. If I wanted to show A, I would turn it to the side. So now it is also showing A. So what they've also done quite cleverly is they've they've mixed up the A, B, and C for each one. So you can't just check what your buddy is showing and just turn yours the same way because that's not going to work. 
So effectively, to explain this, and I'm going to show you a short little video of a um, of that uh, what I did with a group, um, wh what I did with a group today. What happens is the questions will appear, and I'm going to show the video at the end. Um, but because uh, I want to show the, or maybe I should show the video now, just to show you what it actually looks like. So the questions appear on the board. They see the question. They see A, B, or C. They get given a little bit of time to think about what the results are, and then I walk around in the class and scan it. Now, bear in mind, this is a group of, this is a class of 35 learners that I did this, um, that I actually did this with. So let me just quickly share my screen again. Right, so this, this, as you can see, they've all got it raised now. They're still. And just notice how quickly I can actually move through the class and scan. Right. At that point, I'm looking at the board to check who has not been scanned yet so that it shows me the learners that have been scanned. Because at this point, you'll see it took 20 seconds and I've scanned 30, I think it's 33 of the 35 learners in the class. I've already scanned their answers. Right. Right, so now I've scanned everyone's. Right, it took around 30 seconds or so to scan. And there you can see on the board, there are the questions. And then the next minute, what's going to appear? So this video cuts off. At, right, there it immediately shows the answer. Remember what I said? Immediate feedback. Instant feedback. Learners get to answer questions, and I immediately know what they said. Right? So, Cornet, to answer your question, um, quizzes goes up to 60 learners in a class. So you can print it. The, the, the template allows for up to 60 that you can scan. One thing that is fascinating to me as well, and I'm going to show you how this works a little bit later. Um, what is interesting is as these learners did it, because this was this class's first time of ever experiencing it, as they did it, they got more and more used to the concept of what actually is showing. And we'll we'll show you when we get to that practical side of putting up your paper, putting it down, putting it up, putting it down. When do you do which one, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the basis of this thing. So just, let me just run through this again very quickly to so that you understand. There's a question on the board. I've set up a quiz beforehand and I, they get the question based on whatever it is that they think the answer is. They will then turn their blocks to say A, B, C or D and it'll record the answer. And as I said, this class, as you can say, as you can see, just to play through this again. Right, so I'm not going to show this again, but just to give you the sense of how quick that is for the question. Now, the great thing the the teacher immediately remarked when I when I we did this in the class is this is kind of like homework, only the difference is no one gets to not raise their hand. Every single learner has to respond and has to answer, and she gets feedback from that. So let's have a look at the kind of feedback that we're talking about when we when we are discussing that. Now, um, this is the quizzes app itself, right? I'm not going to go into all the detail on quizzes, but quizzes itself, we have we have had sessions on that in the past. And I'm sure we'll have more sessions on that. But quizzes is a really powerful tool that allows you to create these quizzes that in the past, I when I was a teacher, I used this a lot, but I used it in a I used it as a digital assessment with my learners. I would assign it as homework. I would send it to them um, 
I would send a link to them. And it was always a case of, of uh, the, cl the classes that I had were very varied in that some of them were able to have access and to do this. Um, however, you, you have to understand that it is sometimes it's a tricky kind of thing to to always get them to do that. This, they're in a classroom. They can do that. Now, how do I actually make this? Oh, before I show that, I want to show you the report that it generates because this is, to me, one of the great, great things about it. Remember what I said, that instant feedback. What you saw there in the class is the kids getting immediate feedback on what they were doing. But as a teacher, if I go into this great eight math quiz that I'd set up for them now, here I get to see feedback on exactly what is happening in terms of the answer. So I can see player 32 got eight of them correct and two of them wrong. And I see which ones that they get wrong. They got the last two wrong. So maybe the concentration level dipped. I don't know necessarily. Um, oh, wait, sorry. They didn't get the last two wrong. They just got two of them wrong. Right. So then I get to scroll down and I get to see where all of it's going individually all the way to the bottom where I can notice that over here, player four, I'll talk about player 36 and player 46 in a second. Over here, player four, I know now that this learner is a learner that I might be con should be concerned about. Player seven and player four, actually, all of these kids here at the bottom, because it was a 10, it was a 10 um, questions that I asked them, and they didn't actually respond to all of these things. And what's interesting to me as well is if you look at the way that it shows you, over here, I've got the green blocks. Over here, I've got the red blocks. And then over here, I've got the gray block. So the gray block means that this question was not scanned. There was no answer provided, which is often interesting because now <coughs> it could just simply be a mistake. Oops, I forgot to scan. But I can also start seeing there might be a real kind of lack of confidence in whoever this kid is player 12 because there are five questions that they just simply did not answer they actually wanted to to kind of not respond to that question and what is also even more useful for me is clicking on questions and then immediately i get to see right where are the questions this is question one only 11 students got it right this is question two only 10 students got it right Question three, 26 students got it right. Remember that feedback loop that we're talking about? Now I'm closing the feedback loop because I can kind of say, look, I'm happy with this because 26 got it right, only four got it wrong. I'll pick up who those four are. I can give the individual kind of support to those learners, but I can also see, hey, this is something I cannot simply move on to the next set of work because only 10 of the kids in my class got it right. It's that instant feedback, that immediate understanding. The kids know whether or not they got it right or wrong, and the teacher knows whether or not they got it right or wrong. And everyone can adjust accordingly. A learner can realize, but that is a part of the work I need to review. A teacher can realize, but that is a part of the work I need to teach again. Instant feedback. That is the absolutely critical thing. And then I can get overview where the overview gives me even more kind of breakdown and summary and understanding of this. And this part, you can obviously spend as much time in as you potentially have time for. Now, how challenging is it to actually create these things? Um, hey, let's just quickly refresh this. Does it doesn't want to play along. All right, so there we go. So. Just took a while to load. Right, so overview, it gives me that breakdown of these individual learners. Um, it seems to be wanting to struggle a little bit with that, but it just takes a little bit longer to load. While that is trying to load, let's just open up a new window. Okay, so now the question is how tricky is it to do this? How challenging is it to do this? Like, there was something else I wanted to show before before we um, we get to that. What I recommend when we're using these things. So um, let me just quickly close my 
presentation again for a second. So if you look at these things, there was one big frustrating thing on that, and that is the player one, player two, player three, player four. I don't know Mary, many parents who would ever name their children player one, player two, player three. So how do we deal with that kind of scenario? There are different ways that you can deal with it because I think what's critical with a lot of these things is um, we can show you the tools, but it becomes it only becomes effective once these things become a habit, once kids are used to it. Um, what what it is fascinating within ten questions, how much more used to the questions, how much more used to the whole system the kid learners became when I showed that to them. So. A simple way that you can deal with this thing is you can go and and I would recommend you do this anyway. Once you've pl printed these out, you don't want to print out 60 pages every single week. Please don't do that. I prefer to, I, I love our planet and I would hate for you to destroy it by printing 60 pages every single week. So what should you do? Laminate these things. Get a, uh, a whiteboard marker, not a permanent marker and write the names here at the top. So there's no reason why you can't do that. And then you take a class list and you go one to 40 and you write the names next to that. So that when you hand these out and learners start, will know this eventually, when you hand them out, then Yaku knows that he should take player one. And Melissa will know that she should take player two. That's the idea behind this. So now we know that I now I know that the who player one actually is, who player two is. So when I look at the report, it makes more sense to me and I can start understanding it. Um, you can, and I'm not gonna go into that, so you're welcome to go and explore that. You can set up your own classes in quizzes as well. Um, so you can do this over there is a tab called classes, which allows you to create a class. You can copy and paste these things in. Um, yes, these questions can be Afrikaans or English. It depends entirely on how you set it up, Kornay. I'll show you now. Um, the questions can be in easy closer as well. The only thing that won't change is the A, B, C, and D. That's the only part that remains consistent, <laughs> or constant at least. So in classes, you could you could import it from a Google Classroom roster. You could set it up manually by one by adding these learners one by one. And then when you assign it, it automatically assigns. That's a bit more complicated. So I'm not going to go into that now. If you want to play around with quizzes, I suggest you just get going with it. And if you find it something that you really want to add to your to your routine, and that's a critical thing that I said there, add to your routine. Not stand alone, add into what you're doing as your teaching practice. Then I then I recommend you go and explore how to do this. There are lots of videos that you can use or that you can find on quizzes itself that'll show you how to do, how to get all those things. You'll see over here, you can get go into the super trainer program and you, they'll teach you everything that you need to know about the system. But now I want to show you how incredibly tricky it is to set up these quizzes. Right, so we are going to look for a physical science grade five test. I'm not a physical science grade five teacher, never taught it. So please do not hold it against me if I add questions that are not appropriate. What it does now, and this is the thing that I really, really, really love about quizzes, is it goes into an enormous bank of questions that have already been created. You will see here, if you've looked at it yet, I found one million quizzes, a million results for that search string, physical science grade five. Now, there won't be a million physical science grade five ones that I can guarantee you, but there'll be a lot. So here I've got two options. And option one is I have see these, I can use them exactly as they are. You'll see <clears throat> there are questions that people have set up and the, the people have already set up. I can use any of these quizzes as they are. But one of the coolest things I find about quizzes is the following trick that you can do. So if I hover over this one, it'll show me on the right hand side which questions are in this thing. I can just scroll down and I can see the questions that I like. So let's say I don't like question one. If 
but I like question two. Now I just start by clicking add. So there I've added my first question. So you'll see over here, I've got this teleporter thing open. They call it the quick teleport system. So I've got one question added to my quiz. Now I scroll down. I like this question. I'll add it. I scroll down. I like this question. I'll add it. I scroll down. I like this question. I'll add it. All right. So now I've got these questions, four questions from that quiz. But now I decide there's nothing else that I like. So now I go back to my search results. Hover over the next one, science grade five. Right. We'll say, yes, I like this question. Yes, I like this question. OK, there's only three questions. Oh, wait, I've already scrolled to the bottom. Right, so we'll add that question. We'll add that question. They've got eight questions. Let's see what else is nice. Math and science, fourth grade, fifth grade, physical science. OK, so let's add a few more. Add, add, add. There I've got 11 questions already set up and good to go. And all that I now need to do is I say save quiz. And it opens it up. There we go. And of course, if you want to, you can go and edit these. So there's the edit button. So you can go and edit any of these questions as you want. You can add more questions if you want to. You can remove more questions. But I think it's, in, it's incredible how quickly you can set up a quiz. That is how incredibly quickly you set them up. So um, there was a question about Afrikaans as well. Can the questions be used in Afrikaans or in English? Remember, you can do the same thing if you search for these questions. So let's say um, this is a Wetenskap and see if we find anything. Right, there's a grade 11 physical science one in Afrikaans already set up. So I can add all these questions if I want to. I can play it as is. I can scroll down. I can use some of it. There's a Wetenskap class. There's a Physische Kenmerke. There's a Wetenskap Grad 6. Schoolfakken in Afrikaans. Wetenskap Grad 6. Wetenskap Grad 6. So the thing about quizzes as a platform is when you set up a new quiz, a blank one, not do what I did now, but you create your quiz from scratch, then suddenly it is added to this library. So the more we use it, the more things there will be for others to use. So it's it's something that grows onto itself. It self-perpetuates the whole, the whole time, which is why it's such a cool tool. If more people get into it, more people start using it, that we can do this. Right, but let's go back to our physical science quiz that we set up here. So here's my physical science quiz. I'm just going to call it example. Right, hey, come now. Example physical science test. Right, so here comes the real magic that we often overlook. So over here, I'm going to where it says start a live quiz. I'll click on the drop down and I say paper mode. Right, so I want to play the paper mode. So you'll see that there is a mode called classic. Which is a kind of fun gamified version of a quiz type thing. So also highly recommended. It. it is a great thing. I also think the instructor pace is so useful. Um, a lot of us might have been exposed to things like a hoot, which can become a little bit frantic. So the instructor pace mode <coughs> allows me to have a bit more control that it just doesn't go to the next question immediately. Quizzes in general is a little bit more controlled because it's not about speed. It's about accuracy. So that's already something I, I really like. Now, with the asynchronous learning part, unfortunately, as with all of these things, they will constantly give you the option to upgrade, to pay, etc. So you'll see there's the upgrade your plan, there's the etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there are some of these things that are unfortunately locked behind a paywall. Excuse me, and you can go and have a look at what that is and if you're interested in potentially procuring it. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the session as well. So what we want to do is we want to go to start the live quiz and we want to go to paper mode. So we click on paper mode 
and you'll see the first time you open it up, it'll give it'll these boxes won't be ticked because it wants you to first go and complete these steps. So you first need to get these cue cards and then you first need to and then you need to get the app on your phone. Right. If you don't have those, you can't do you can't play this thing. So with the cue cards, just to show you quickly how it works, if you say print. It'll take you to this screen where it says, yeah, you can print and it'll give you a little bit of instructions as to what you need to do when you do the cue card, um, how it works. It'll show you, please make sure that when you're holding it up, do it like this. These are just instructions you'll give your learners. And there you see there's your first cue card. And as I said, it's all the way from one to 60. So you can play with a maximum of 60 learners in your classroom. You can't play with more than more than 60, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't have to be A4, Cornet, but I think from what I've used it, I would not recommend printing it smaller um, for the simple reason that the smaller you print it, the trickier it is for your phone to scan it. So if it's if it's an A4, then you can basically stand in the front of your classroom and kind of just sweep across the classroom and get most of them. If you're going to be printing it as an A5, you might run into the issue of it struggling to to scan it um, because it is simply smaller. Right. So obviously I think it'll work even if you shrink it down to smaller than an A5, but the smaller it gets, the harder it gets to scan. That's the that's kind of the, the bottom line. Right. So let's say I've got this and I've got this. I've got these two things. I am now going to start the process of this game. So it gets me to this point. I now need to. I now need to to actually um, play the game. So let me just kind of get these two other ones set up. So you'll see that it asks me open the quizzes mobile app or scan a QR code to start. So you can do it either way. Both of them work perfectly fine. I think it's kind of easier to just open the quizzes app because the minute that you open the quizzes app, which is then connected to this thing, it'll show you. Um, if you can just have a look at my camera very quickly, it'll show you there that there's a paper mode that is ready to go, right? So now it's going to tell me, OK, we are now going to play this mode. So I say start now and then on the screen, what you need to now imagine is this that you're seeing in front of you. This screen is what you will typically put on the. Um, you'll typically want to put this screen on your data projector so that the learners can see this. This is my first question. Susan blew up a balloon until it was completely full and as big as a soccer ball. Which of the following correctly describes the air inside of the balloon? Right. So what I now need to do. Uh, just give me a second. Right. Okay, so I'm going to scan the responses now. And now you see here on the side, let me just take this away so you can see. So I've scanned. There it'll show you. I've scanned player one has been scanned. And here I go and I scan player two. And I've got two more set up here. I'm going to scan player three. And I'm going to scan player four. Now what's happened is it now knows that there are four players in this thing on my on my side, and I'll show you now on the on the phone how it works in a minute. So now I'm going to say submit. And on the board, it shows me how they did. So player one got 600, player three got 600, player two got a drop of well, 600 points. It's on inconsequential how these points really work. Um, and immediately it gives me the opportunity as a teacher to discuss this with my classroom rather than just a crazy let's go for the next question, go for the next question. Now what's Great is on my phone. I will now control when the next question is going to happen. So you'll see on the board, there's no button that says next on my phone. I'm now going to press the next question. It goes to the next question. Once the learners start holding up their, 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 their answers, I now press scan response. And what you'll see over here is it shows me. It actually shows me how many of them are still needing to be scanned, right? So player one, player two, player three, and player four have to be scanned. So once I start scanning them, you'll see now I've scanned player four. 
I have now scanned player three. I have now scanned player one. So it shows me, have I already scanned them? And I have not scanned player two. So I can say submit. And then it will show me that they all got it wrong. Now, just to quickly um, stop my screen to show you what it looks like on my phone. So have a look here on my phone. So over there, I'm in the app, right? So I'm just going to say next question again. Right, so then it shows me the question and you'll see at the bottom, once I want to, I can then hit the scan responses. So I'm going to say scan responses. Unfortunately, I have to move my camera out of the shot. So there I've scanned the first one and there I've scanned the second one and there I've scanned two more and there we go. Right, so effectively, once you get your head kind of wrapped around this and once you learn to start understanding it, it becomes so much easier for them to buy into it, for them to also get going with it. And the minute that I'm done with something, I can just say in quiz. And once I say in quiz, it shows a, right, this shows on the board as well. So it shows you how the learners did, right? Over there, I've got my four learners. Player three and player one got question one right. Question two. So immediately, this is open opens the floor up for a discussion in the class on the questions that they got wrong. Clearly, as a teacher, I have to focus on question three and question two because they just got everything wrong. Again, formative assessment, the assessment for learning allows me to stop determine whether kids or not kids have it right and move on. And again, your kids do not need mobile devices in order to do this. You need a cell phone and you preferably need to have a, a um, data projector or a TV in your classroom, but you could potentially read them the questions and then read them A is this, B is that, C is this, D is that. So in that instance, you don't even need to have that. So that is the kind of extent that you can go with this. And just to remind you again, what I would really, really recommend um, when you when you try and have turn this into a a habit is having having these um, making sure that you have these laminated so that you can reuse them. That you've got a set of them. I know some teachers have said. Or some people that I've spoken to using them have like um, ring binders where they put them, where they put all 60 in a ring binder. Again, the only critical thing is the part that needs to remain unobstructed is just the black block. None of the rest that's around it really matters all that much what's on it. It's the black block that needs to be scanned. So as long as that's clear and easy to read, you can punch holes in the side. You can write names at the top. You can do all sorts of things like that. That is the critical part that you need to make sure remains accessible. And again, once you start playing around with what is available in quizzes, you will find that there's, there are so many tools inside of the system that you can actually use that, that helps you, um, that can help you set up these quizzes, that can help you do all of these things. So they immediately I've got my things. One more thing that I did want to show you, um, from quizzes before we actually yes one more thing i want to show you and then i'm going to open up um for questions that people might want to ask questions right so um we little is when i when i want to um set one of these things so i'm going to go to my library i'm going to have a look at my different ones that i have so um let's just go to i'll just use this one as an example and I'm going to start the live quiz again, going to go into paper mode. If you look here, you'll see it gives me the option here, assign cue cards to students. So then I could say assign. And when I say assign, you'll see that here are some of the classes that I have created, the different classes that I have. So from that, I can actually go and assign the students to numbers, and then that tracks their record over time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a better way of eventually managing it. but if you're doing it the first time around, it can be a little bit confusing if you want to add that element into it. We want called Swift Grade. 
Thanks, Melissa has now put up a question there. And just because we like confusing you a little bit, remember when we spoke about quizzes, we asked you, have you ever heard of plickers? Which isn't quizzes, but it is kind of like the forerunner of quizzes. So plickers came up with this concept and then quizzes took it and went further with it. I love the fact that quizzes allows you to import questions, which I think takes it to an entirely different level, having that vast bank of resources. And I love the fact that if you do get to a point where you do have access to more devices, then all the things that you set up to be used in, an, in, a, in a low tech solution can now be used in a high tech solution as well, which I think is fantastic. It's got that portability added to it. So what Zipgrade is, Zipgrade is basically when you create a bubble quiz. Right, so in other words, there's a um, your typical A, B, C, D, E. That's what Zipgrade does. Now, Swiftgrade is going to do the same thing. It's kind of the same type of principle. We're going to take the concept of the bubble quiz and we're just going to really supercharge it with all sorts of really great new features. What I'm going to show you with, with Swiftgrade, like with quizzes, is only the tip of the iceberg. So you need to go and explore what else we can do with it. So what Swiftgrade effectively does is Swiftgrade allows me to create was to create answer sheets that look like this, right? So um, if you have a look at these answer sheets, there I've got multiple answer sheets. So let me just put two of them next to each other so you can see. Okay, there's a whole bunch of them together. But effectively, what these answer sheets look like um, is you'll see these answer sheets have two types of things to them. They have over here, they've got the, um, the multiple choice part. And what I'm doing now is not a good idea because you shouldn't really be doing that on these. And then over here in the green, they've got blocks where you actually fill in answers. Now, in this case, I've only used numbers, but you can do this with text as well, or not text, with, with words. You do not need to use um, it. You do not actually have to use um, only numbers. It is designed to read words as well. So how does it work? I'm going to show you how I mark this test. So let me just quickly open up the app on my phone. Right, so I'm going to open up the app and I'm going to go to the assessment. So over here, if you can see on my phone, I've got my assessment and I'm going to select the scan mode. Right, so now we're going to start scanning these and I'm going to turn them over as quickly as they are scanned. And you get the idea of what I'm talking about. This is me marking a 10 mark test by simply flipping over a page. Right? I've already got, I've already marked 12 learners. So there we go to 13. There we go to 14. Just to give you the idea of how quick and easy it is to mark things with this. Right, so I'm not going to actually go and submit these scans because I did this earlier. So the, this this class has already been has already been marked. But effectively, what SwiftGrade does, as I said, is it creates a mark sheet, a mark sheet that allows you to have bubble questions, allows you to have written questions. In this case, I only use numbers, um, but it really goes, and and it and it allows you to go to that kind of extreme. Um, of, of marking, and I think everyone will agree that marked pretty quickly. It did not take me very long to mark those things. So, I really didn't believe you that it was so fast, and it's insanely fast. Right, so now the question is, it can't only be fast, it needs to actually work as well. So I want to show you this and um, what actually happens now with that. So it's been marked. So we'll first look at how the tool works and then I'll show you how we set it up. So over here, you'll see I've got assessment three. 
22 results, 22 learners that actually completed this. But then importantly, once I've actually scanned these things, it cannot capture every single thing 100% accurately when it does that. Um, so you'll see here, it tells me that it needs grading, which kind of defeats the purpose. I thought this thing is an automatic grader. Why am I now still involved in grading this thing? So let me show you the process that needs to happen next. So once you've scanned it, I'm going to click on that needs grading and it opens up the, the actual results of this um, of the scan that I did. Now, when it opens it up, it gives me very quite impressively, I did not actually input this as a class beforehand, but these kids had to write their names down. So there we go. There are the names of the people that actually scanned all these things, right? It might not have picked all of it up 100% accurately, but I'm going to show you how you can create classes as well to make sure it's even more accurate. Um, JC, the learner's handwriting obviously will have an impact. The clearer they can write, the more likely it's going to pick it up correctly. Um, however, like with all of these artificial intelligence things, it gets better and it is getting better. Now I'm going to show you where that part comes in, the handwriting thing that you spoke about. So when I click on this button over here, it then expands all the answers for all the learners. So let me click on that, expand all. And what it does now is it shows me what it actually marked and it shows me everything that was captured. So you can see over here, it captured the A, it captured the B, it captured the B, but the B is wrong. So in each of these, I can now check whether or not it captured it correctly. What I can tell you, when it comes to the bubble, the bubbles, um, it is very, 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 very accurate. It really, really is accurate. Um, it struggles a little bit more when it comes to trying to pick these things up. But have a look at this, this example. So the answer was supposed to be, x plus 2 to the power of 2, right? x plus 2 squared. <clears throat> this learner wrote x minus 3, x minus 3. But then you can see as well, have a look at that. That is what he wrote. So that's accurate. Now you can go and you can scroll through all of these things and check it, but that doesn't really help you in terms of, um, excuse me, speeding up your process. So we want to find ways that this can speed up our process. And this is where the filter becomes a critical part. So if I click on filters, it shows me that I can now filter out different types of questions. Sorry, expand it again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so over here, you've got the low confidence part, which is the critical thing that you need to look at. Low confidence means that is the part where it scanned and wasn't able to scan it with any certainty. So whenever you scan it the first time, the best idea is open up the filter and select all of these things, show only the low confidence. So now it's going to show me only the parts that it struggled to capture. And you will pick up a pattern here. If you look at the kinds of things that it didn't scan correctly, I mean, I think we can forgive it. Look at this, whatever the learner wrote there. I can understand why it struggled to scan that correctly. Um, because, I mean, that just does not look like that. If we scroll down and we look at the next one, kind of the same thing. The answer is supposed to be three. They actually wrote down three, scratched it out, and then wrote A equals seven. The other part where it struggled a little bit, what I've also found, is it's better when they write in black and not in blue. So some of these learners were writing in blue as well. It, it just works better if they don't do that. Right, so over here you can see that, like it really gets it confused by that's the answer that it picked up because it saw that three like scratches there and then tried to figure out what's going on and it didn't quite get it right. The thing is what you can do always with this thing, and this is why the check is there, I can then go and I can say, but they actually got it right. Because I then read and I check this 
And I say, no, 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 they actually got it right. So now I'm happy with that answer. I scroll down. Yeah, an interesting thing that I picked up. This is simply me trying to go too quick. You saw me flipping over the pages. This was just, I wanted to really brag with this thing and rushed it. So it kind of struggled, but to, to get this right. But I think it's pretty impressive that it even got that scanned it correctly, because that is what the learner wrote, A equals five, which is not the right answer. And then I scroll down and I'll pick up some other ones over here. Um, here's a classic example of the handwriting thing that you spoke about and um, that JC mentioned. This kid has a pretty, um, lots of scratches and lots of things that confused confused it. So it's a good idea what, what I told the learners when they were doing it, because a number of them said, how do we do calculations? What do we do if we want to do calculations? So you can obviously give them a piece of paper that they do calculations on. Um, what I also pointed out is, remember, it is only going to scan this area. It only wants to scan that. It needs to make sure that these quarters here in the top can be scanned. And then at the bottom, just to show you that as well, there's a barcode and there are things there that need to be scanned. Those are the parts that need to be unobstructed. So if you have to, you've actually got a little bit of white space over here where you can scribble and write stuff down. Should you need to do that, um, if that is a if that is a requirement for you in in whatever the thing is that you're going to be doing. Um, however, if we think about it, I marked, and this again, this really it got this very very badly confused. Other than that, if you look at it, this is another thing that I think is really cool. It actually auto corrected it. Because um, this learner wrote A equals 21, and the answer is supposed to be 21, and it just kind of figured that out on its own, that it shouldn't take that as wrong. It should just autocorrect it to that, which means it's got things built in that allows you to um, not worry about capitalization and things like that. It'll kind of figure it out on its own. And then again, if we scroll down, all in all, if you think about it, I'm talking about 22 learners that answered 10 questions each and it was scanned. And if you look at how many questions it actually struggled with, I think it's pretty remarkable how accurate it was able to scan this. These are the only things I need to check. And I've got a 22, I've got a 10 more question um, for 22 learners with, with written answers, not just bubble answers, scanned and done and dusted. Really, really useful. And then again, part of that formative assessment, the assessment for learning is knowing where things went wrong. So I can go on answers and then I go through the questions one by one. Um, it's taking a little bit longer to load now. Right, so yeah, I can go through the questions one by one. I Obviously, I've got all my filters applied now again. So now I'll just put on, just open up everything again. I'd reset. Okay, it's just taking it. We'll get back to that in a second. But I think this to me is the critical part. When we get to the averages, it shows me the kind of marks that they're getting. Oh, sorry, that is the answers part that I wanted to check specifically. Right. So here it shows me all the answers and I kind of get a breakdown. And then it, if I go to analysis, which is the last part um, of this thing, it tells me the same as what we had with the other one. It starts giving me a breakdown of the questions that were right, the questions that were wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So over here, I've got 10 questions. Oh, I've got the 10 questions. It has flagged these for me. Right. You'll see these have been flagged as questions where the majority of the learners got it wrong. Only three learners got this one right, and only two learners got this one right. So now I know this is something I need to pay attention to. I should go and reteach it, focus in on what needs to be done. Um, yes, the results can be printed out. I just need to double check where that button is. I found it earlier. Um, but yes, there we go. There's the download results. So over here, you have the option to download the results, and it'll give you a printout of whatever it is that you scanned. And of course, you're going to have you can have your original copies with you as well. OK, so same as what we did with quizzes, let's have a look at how you actually set this thing up now. 
So how do we go about setting this whole thing up? When you log into SwiftGrade the first time, you will see something that looks like this. It's very straightforward. It's very clean. It's very simple. I created one class. I called it test class, and I tested this with, with a couple of my colleagues. I used the same test class for the test that I ran today with, with the students as well. But the idea is, and this is how it works, it wants you to create a class for ideally, JC, black pen, block letters, a lot more accurate, right? So um, all, also what I want to show you very quickly when it comes to just the multiple choice thing. So there you've got a little button that just allows you to quickly generate a multiple choice grid um, and you can decide how many you want. But I think one of the cool things about it is immediately it shows you you can potentially have a hundred multiple choice questions that you ask for learners and that is one page and it'll kind of scan it at the same speed as what I showed you just now. Yes, Mina, I have haven't really tried the pencil extensively. Um, I know one of the learners when they were answering this was using pencil and it did work. It depends on how how well they can do it. If it's dark enough, um, uh, I think if it's dark enough, it shouldn't be a problem. I haven't tested it extensively to know whether or not pencil. I know they recommend using pen. Um, black pen as it is the darkest way of coloring it in. And the other thing that's important is kids sometimes want to make crosses and not actually color it in. So you'll have to explain that to them, but I'm pretty sure a dark enough pencil will work. I get why you're asking about pencil, because if they want to change their answer, how do they change their answer? Um, but generally when it comes to when it comes to to scanning and recognizing handwriting, etc., it does struggle a bit more with pencil. From personal experience, and don't I can't say with certainty when it comes to Swift Grade. I just know that they do recommend pen. Just want to double check: is anyone else lost my sound as well? No, Yaku, loud and clear. Fantastic. Right. So I think this is something that's kind of important to remember: a hundred multiple choice questions on one sheet. Not that we always do things in multiple choice, but I mean, you can test pretty much anything in multiple choice. Not everything, but a lot of things can be tested. So what do I do? I want to create a class. We want to create our, a new class. I am going to call it my new class, whatever, the, whatever you want to call it. It's as simple as that. And we say create. In my new class, I now have the option to create my first answer key but before i want to create my answer key i want to add students to this as well so over there is the students option i click on students and then when i add students there are two ways to add students right you can go and if your kids are a little bit more tech savvy and they understand how these things work and they've done things like this before you can generate the code and you can send the code to the kids and they can effectively enroll themselves into your classroom, which is something I always enjoy doing because the learners in my class had gotten used to this process. But if you aren't, if your learners aren't used to that process, we can take this option of adding them manually. And this is really, really, really quick and easy to do. So I can basically, um, I think I've got uh, some names here. I'm just going to check in my yeah, over here so these are just some dummy names that i prepared before and you'll see this looks like a spreadsheet so you can actually go and generate all of this in a spreadsheet i'm going to go and say um paste over here so we'll just paste these names and come on no, i didn't copy it correctly let me just do that again Now, now I am trying to copy from the wrong place. Anyway, so um, just give me a second and I just open up a a list of learner random generated names. The the key thing with this that I think is 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 important to understand is like with all of these things, it has two sides to it. It has the teacher side to it and the learner side to it. So you'll see it has this option 
for them to create an account where they will have a password and a username. So they can also check the results of the quizzes that they've completed. They can also, you can assign quizzes to them at certain times. And what's great about SwiftGrade, like with quizzes that we looked at, it has both this offline low tech kind of me scanning with myself and as a teacher option. But if you have access to better technology, it also has the option to do an online quiz type of thing where you ask them questions and they respond to that and they get instant instant um, feedback, et cetera, et cetera. So you have that option, which is which is very useful to have the two. So, right, if I just copy this list of names and surnames from a sheet, it just goes in automatically generates as part of that things. I'm going to say I want to automatically generate you passwords and usernames and we're just going to say add students right so there are the usernames and the passwords so if these kids are not necessarily going to log in you can just do it like that um, these are kind of impossible usernames and passwords to remember so once you have it um, it's important to kind of make sure that you save these somewhere again you can select all of this it looks like a spreadsheet because you know it acts exactly like one and you can paste it into a spreadsheet. So I'm just on my other screen um, just to show you here. I literally just copied and pasted it um, so that I can keep a record of this for a later stage. Quick and easy, I've created my classroom and now I've added my students. Now, the reason why I want to be able to do that is I just want to show you here again on the camera as it's adding the students. Right, so here it tells me, please download student passwords as you cannot see them again after you have set them up, but you can reset them if someone forgets them. Um, but over here on my camera again, I want to show you um, that. Oh, my highlight has gone missing. Right, let me just show you the pencil. Over here, you'll see it doesn't actually have that top bit where it asks for the name and the surname and the email and all those things. It actually has the person's name. My um, e-learning colleague, Evan Papir, his name is listed over here. What that means is this specific sheet that I've created is specific to him. It will automatically pick up, it is his response, and it will save his response next to his name, which is the useful part of creating a class first. Right, so now I've got my class, I've got them set, there's all of them ready to go, now, how do I actually create a, how do I actually create this quiz that I now want to create? All right, we're going to go to assessments and I click on create. Now, this is the part that can be kind of confusing if uh, the first time that you're using it, because there are no spaces to enter the questions. This is only input the answers to your assessment. I think that is the critical thing to understand. You have to input only the answers to whatever it is that you've set up. The cool thing about this for me is any test or quiz or thing that you've set up in the past is automatically can be marked with this tool. Um, you can take anything that you've set up in the past and immediately just use it for this. So what you'll typically do, and I'm just going to um, open up a little test that I create um, or system questions that I was able to grab earlier. Right, so I just generated this random test on physical science. Again, I'm not a physical science teacher, so please do not um, uh, do not complain too much of the questions are, aren't in line. That is where your own curriculum expertise comes in. I just felt that I always use the example of, of um, English as my subject. So I felt this time let's do some maths and do some physical science for something else and something different. So I just generated these questions um, and I've got my first question. I'm not going to copy and paste this question in. There's my question one, there's my question two, there's question three, question four, question five, question six, and then questions seven, eight, nine, and 10 are ones that I'm going to generate as full in the answer. So that is my question paper. I can decide how I want to do this. What I did when I um, did the practical example today is I put this question paper on the 
on the data projector on the overhead so they could so they could read i didn't have to print the question paper because again i do not i never want to advocate unnecessary printing and i know that if we are going to print question papers um like this or answer sheets like this we are going to use a little bit more paper to do that so now in a class again for a formative assessment for the assessment for learning purposes i simply put this question I show them the first few questions, question one, two, three, four. I can make it smaller, I can make it bigger, I can kind of present it the way that I want to. And there I've got my questions. But what do I do on Swift Grade? Over here on Swift Grade, what I now need to do is I now need to take whatever the answer is supposed to be, right? So whatever my answer over here will be, I am going to now add it so that it goes into whatever the block over here is going to say. Right, there's multiple types of questions. Let's have a look at what we can what we can do. So over here it says fill in the blank, which is kind of the default one, numeric, math, or multiple choice. So we want multiple choice. Once I have my multiple choice selected, you'll see it says A, B, C, D, or E. Um, and I am now just going to scroll down because I don't know the answers. So here are all my answers, and it really is as simple as this. So there's B. I hit enter, I say D, I hit enter, and there's A, enter, uh, where is it now, C, and A, and uh, question six is, oh wait, I got one wrong. Right, so if I got this one wrong, so now I can just go back and change it. What I can also do is I can just say, if I just want to remove these quickly, and I want to say, Look, I am going to have multiple choice questions. I want to add, um, give me seven of them. Right, so there are seven multiple choice questions set up and ready to go because I know, actually I want six. So because I know my first six questions are multiple choice. So now I've got it over here. I just need to read carefully and check and say that's B, that's D, that's A, that's C, that's A. Oh, wait. So that's not C, that's again C, and then that's A. Right, so there's my first six questions set, ready to go. Now the next ones that I need is fill in the blank. So I'm going to select this option and say, this is now supposed to be fill in the blank. Multiple rows, let's create multiple rows. I don't want that many rows, I only want... Oh wait, it's going to tell me up to num number what? So I want to go number seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go in the blanks and now i just need to take the answers so i can go and retype it if, if i want to or i can just say copy and paste and sublimation copy and paste friction copy and paste and then lastly plastic copy and paste and this just for interest sake for those of you wondering where did you get this multiple choice question on this this was generated using chat gpt in like a minute so then i got the questions and the answers so i can copy and paste that you can see how quick that was and you have got my question paper good to go i'm done that's it this thing is finished right and now i just simply click on create and what type of answer sheets will be used for this assessment we're going to use the paper mode And there it is. Now, what's cool about this, what I really like, is it it highlights when I get to the classroom. So let's just maximize the classroom now again, because we're done with that part. It highlights this part to you, the next step that you're supposed to take all the time. So you then see, OK, I'm going to click on that. My next step is I need to print it. And when you go to the printing of it, it will now generate all of these sheets for you. And you'll see over here that one's been generated for Burke Anthony. Right, um, one sheet per student. Duh, duh, duh. So I want to now generate all of these sheets. I'm gonna. This is just now an example of what it's gonna look like, and then I download it, and it is now going to effectively look at what it's supposed to generate. Okay, so it has generated my answer sheet. Let me quickly go and grab it so I can show you what it looks like. So there is my answer sheet, good to go. 
This is Burke Anthony's one. This is England Cecilia's one. This is David Kona's one. So it generates these 19 pages for the 19 learners that I've got in my, in my class. And I just simply print those out and hand it out to the learners. And they've got my 10, my 10 point multiple quiz. And obviously, as you can see, there's a lot of space here at the bottom if I wanted to add more questions to this, if I wanted to expand on this. You'll also see kind of what it tries to do is it tries to space these things out in a logical way. It'll determine whether or not it's a longer answer, shorter answer, and it'll kind of reshape and resize the blocks depending on what you actually need in those blocks. And then once that part is finished, right, let's just quickly go back to SwiftGrade. So once that part is finished, now it tells me what's the next step. My next step is to scan them. So I need to hand those papers out. I need to hand out the test either as a physical copy that I give to the learners or as something that I can display on, on, um, on my projector, display on the TV, and they can see what the questions are. Or you can obviously, if you still want to, you can read the questions to them, ask them to write it. You can do this as a nice little spelling test as well. Print out these things, have them do spelling tests, um, and you can use it from the lower grade all the way up to our matriculant, uh, up to our matriculants in various guys. It kind of comes down to your own creative implementation of this thing. And there we have our thing. Now I um, don't have a printer to print out these things with me, so I can't show you how we scan that. And I also cannot split myself into nineteen people to answer that. Um, but as you can see, when I when I hit that photo button, it tells me that I need to get the Swift Grade um, app, and that is the tool I use to end up grading to end up grading this test. Um, just something else that I think is important to to uh, show. If I get to the go back to the class that I've already set up, you'll see it looks the same. The only difference is it's got this next step is the little bar graph that it shows you, showing that it has been done already. You can always go and just grade, grade some of them at a time. So if we click on this little button over here, if I click on it, you'll see immediately I've selected it and it gives me the option to either go and edit any of these quizzes. I can rename it. I can copy it. Importantly, I can go and print new versions of it so you can use it again. Um, obviously, when you copy it, if you want to kind of clean it, that you take away the previous answers, you'll need to do the copy part of it. And then you can scan it anytime. And you on your phone, you're going to do the same kind of process. Your phone, the, the phone app looks very similar to just show you <clears throat> that again on the on the camera. Right, so over there you see the phone app. It looks the same. I just click on whatever one it is that I want to do. It opens up these options at the bottom, one of them being take the photo. What it also doesn't really want you to do, and that's why I said you need to have a computer as well, is it is very difficult to edit these things and create these things on your phone. It is much easier to do this. Um, no, no, Corona, you do not create a new class for each assessment. The idea of the new class, you'll see that whenever I, if I go back to my new class now, this one is automatically, when I create that printout, it is assigned to these students, to the 19 students that are in the class. So every assessment that I create for them will automatically create 19 answer sheets. Right, it'll create 19 answer sheets based on the students that are in the class. Except, of course, if I click and add more students and um, just something, let me just go, go through this process again. So I'm going to create like a super short little quiz. I'm just going to say this is multiple choice. We're going to have three questions, A, B, and C. And we're going to say create. I'm going to call it a paper based one. I'm not going to go into the online version of it now. This is something that I recommended you explore on your own. <clears throat> right, so assessment two, I. OK, I think I went a little bit too quick for it now. Right, so I um, with assessment two, I think it's still kind of creating it. 
Um, I rushed through that process a little bit, but you'll see. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I see now I forgot to share my screen. Right, so just to just to explain that again. So with assessment one, the difference between these two classes, so if I go back to my classes, the difference between these two classes is anything that I create in this class will automatically have 19 copies that it will be able to print. So one copy for each learner in the class. Over here, it'll automatically create four copies. So if you teach multiple classes, if you've got, for example, a grade eight class, a grade nine class, a grade 10 class, or you might have two grade eight classes, two grade nine classes, then you will create one for each class. However, what you want to then do is you want to make sure that um, for those for those ones that you are creating, that you or for each class you to create the thing in the right one because ultimately what is going to happen is it creates for those 19 students. Remember when I showed you the example of the PDF that it actually generated for us? It generates this PDF for these learners specifically. So this one has been created for Burke and Tony for England Cecilia. And when the system is scanning, it uses these little identifiers in the corner, the four identifiers and the barcode in the middle. It uses that to link whatever the learner has answered to their name so that you can see who has done what, who is actually answering um, which question. Right, that basically covers those two tools that I want what I wanted to show you about those two tools. I think one thing that still to me, if you go through the effort and if you go through the time to put to 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 put this together um, to to try these things, just remember that you will always have the option to if I'm going to scan these things, just keep this. I think keep this in mind, the option that having shown you how that works, how quick and easy it is, right? So let's just get this one right. It is. All right, and there we go. And now we're scanning. Right, I think that is a critical part that we sometimes need to remember. How quickly these things can scan when you are actually just doing it in a, um, when you're trying to write these tests, when you're trying to get them to, or when you want to assess these things. Um, really, it can be an incredible time saver, but at the same time, it actually allows us to have the kind of information that we need in our classrooms in order for us to adapt and change the way that we are able to teach, to know what our learners know and know what our learners don't know. And again, when we look at the, 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 the side that I didn't explore now in either one of the two is the part where the students are then able to log in and are able to track their own progress, are able to see how they did in these things. Because remember, our focus was on low tech formative assessment. What are the what are the solutions that they have? What are the options that you have if you do not have the ability to log in and to do those things? If you can log in, if you have internet connectivity, if you can do these things, there are lots of other amazing tools that you can use. Um, and the, even these tools, you can also use them. The critical thing is just exploring. And I think if you if you consider both of the tools that we looked at today, the quizzes, um, the quizzes. For I'll get to coordinate on the question now. If you consider quizzes, the paperless or the, not the paperless quizzes, the paper mode, and um, Swift Grade, both of them come down to having a kind of routine that you're following, making sure learners are used to it, making sure that people know and understand how these things work. Right, Cornet, your question: um, If you have two different classes with 22 or 28 kids, must I create only one class for all 50 kids per test, or must I create the test again for the second class? 
I would suggest that you rather create two classes. I think it's going to be able to keep these things separate. Um, what you can do, I'll be honest, I haven't actually tested this, but I'm but let's make let's double check if it works. So if I copy, if I select a quiz and I copy it, you can see I can actually just copy it to a different class. Uh, oh wait, sorry, I see I'm not sharing again. Let me just quickly share again to show you how I did that. Right, so um, just go back here. So if, for example, there's something in test class that I've created that I would like to create in new class. So in other words, um, the example that you had, Kone, you've got 22 kids in one class and 28 in the other. So let's pretend this is the class with 22 and this is the class with 28. You've now already set it up. That's a horrible eight, but it's okay. You've already set up your thing in test class. Now you want to have a new class. So what you can do is you simply open up the test class and then you go and select the test that you want to have. You click on that to select it. You'll see there's the copy option. And when you copy it, it asks you where do you want to copy it to. I want to copy it to the new class. Here's also the option where you can switch it between paper and online. If you've set it up as a paper test, but now you want to have it written as an online one, you can then make a copy of it and switch it to online. So here we go. I'm going to copy to my new class. We'll say copy and you'll see here in new class. Now it asks me again, print the answer sheet. So if I click on print, suddenly it has the it'll have the names of the learners in that class and not the names of the learners in the other class. What I also wanted to show you, what is also a useful option to have is whenever you're going to generate it, it gives you this one sheet per student. Plus, I want to have five extra no name sheets as an example. Now, these no name sheets. Just to show you the difference between these two, um, if I'm going to go to the to my camera again. So the difference between these no name sheets. You see it's starting to get a little bit darker now. Um, you'll see the one has a blo has blocks where they're supposed to fill in their name, their last name and their email address, whereas the other one does not have those blocks. Right, you'll see here at the top. So there are no blocks over there. Over here it asks for the name, the surname and the email address. Now. What that means then is you can create these blank ones as well. If there are additional learners that are in your classroom, whatever the case might be. I hope that answers the question. I see Kuna has said thanks. Any other questions? I think at the end of the day, what's critical about these things is we want to be able to kind of capture as much information about our learners, but it becomes or capture the, 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 the formative side of things, make sure they are completing things, make sure they've gone through things, but we just simply, it becomes so difficult to at times be able to have this um, this feedback loop that we actually really really require. This is such a critical part of of the learning process, which is often not there. But we are so pressed for time; it's so challenging for us sometimes to find the time to just go and do these things. And I hope, I really hope, in today's session, I've shown you that through the use of both of these tools, it's really not that difficult to firstly set up your questions or to set up these, these sheets. And secondly, it is so quick to get the answers in, to get to gauge where your learners are, to allow your learners to gauge themselves where they are so that you know how we can go and actually identify the missing knowledge and teach it and build this content before we actually have to get to that formal assessment, that test, whatever it is that they need to do so that we know that we have covered it, that we know that we're not leaving learners behind 
and we know we've built the necessary foundations to be able to actually construct the knowledge they need for that formal assessment. And with that, I think ultimately we're always worried when we want to do a lot of these things that we won't have time to do it. But with these things, you're going to have more time on your hands if you implement them effectively and your learners will just simply excel, which is the great part of knowing what is happening. The both tools that I showed you, all of that is 100% free. Um, as I mentioned, with with quiz with quizzes, quizzes has a paid for version that that does um, allow for additional functionality. Um, but it is something that you could look into. You don't need any of that for the formative assessment part of things. What I what I can say, or what for the paper based, what I can say about SwiftGrade, what is important to note, it's a tool that is in beta at the moment. And um, I have spoken to the developers. They they have said there will always be a free version available, as they are with many of these tools. But some of the more complicated and more advanced functions within it will unfortunately require a paid for service. However, they said they are looking at something, a, a payment for the multiple choice part of it at least, that will be similar to what Zipgrade's payment is at the moment. And I think this is a really critical thing for people to start thinking about. Zipgrade costs, Melissa, what did we say? 160 Rand? Or is it less? 130 Rand. It's 100? like $699. A year, not a month, a year, right? So $699 a year gives you unlimited scans with Zipgrade. At the moment, with SwiftGrade, you have unlimited scans for free. But just to kind of get your mind going a little bit with where this thing is headed with SwiftGrade, they're also looking at infusing it with more and more. Obviously, it's using a lot of AI already to do the recognition of your handwriting, but they're going to infuse more of it so that it is able to analyze an entire paragraph um, but that part is going to be a little bit more expensive. The part that we are currently just looking at, the one word answers, the bubble sheets, all of those things at the moment is free. Some of it might become um, a paid for feature, but we have to start rethinking our whole mentality around paying for digital tools. 130 Rand a year for a tool that could change your assessment, your formative assessment completely. I mean, that's what a, that's what takeaway meals cost these days. So we really need to consider that. Um, what Melissa was talking about, sorry, I had to just kind of, it is important for us to know these things because I feel sustainability is critical. The habit, the regularity of using things. And I'm sure Craig, I see he's also in our session. He will also talk about that. Um, the fact that the free versions are great. However, the, the paid for versions do add so much um, and really bit if I see Craig has, made, has, has commented on that as well. It does add. It does definitely add. We have to start rethinking it. We have to start having these conversations with our SMTs. How do we start looking at these tools? 